Thank you so very much. Um, very, very honored to be here. Sorry I didn't know about the shorts and the dress code. I apologize. Um, I thought I was in Bermuda for a moment. Um, I am very, very honored to be here. Um, let's see what we have. Um, Got Milk has been presented as a case study and discussed really around the world. I, I presented um, Got Milk as it related to solving uh, world hunger in Dublin. Um, it, so all around in different uses of a different application, but I have to say that the, the, the group that benefits, seems to benefit most, are small to medium-sized food companies. Uh, it's interesting. It, it's not the Proctors and the ConAgras and the Nestle's and the Nabisco's, because they're so ingrained in what they do that it's actually difficult for them, especially from a milk campaign, to, to get the learnings, whereas smaller food processors um, not emerging necessarily, but smallers are like grasping, reaching out for, for, for information from, from lessons and from experiences. So it, it's very interesting that I found that most of the feedback, really positive feedback, has been from small uh, to medium-sized um, food processors. Um, the goal for me today is for each person, even you, tough on you though, to have one decent idea um, that will help add value, build share, build sales. Now, that's not so easy, frankly, to do. I mean, you know, I'm going to yak yak about <clears throat> got milk. I, I need your help, I guess is really what I'm saying. I need for you to look at what's being presented and not see got milk as the destination, but see got milk as the vehicle for learning. So even though I'm talking about a, a program that spent $22 million in one state in California, so astronomical amounts of money, the lessons can be applied, but I need your help to do that. So please, if, if you would, I would greatly appreciate it. And um, you could use those napkins to write on if you would. So Gut Milk is this platform for ideas. Um, I'm going to take 10 seconds. I hate talking about, I won't talk about me at all, but the genesis of this is the California Milk Processor Board. So the Milk Processor Board was created in 1993 in California. It was the very first um, board, uh, milk and dairy board, that assessed at the processor level versus the producer level. We have producer level um, uh, milk programs in every state, virtually every state in the United States and around the world. You can look almost anywhere and, and find a milk campaign. They're almost always uh, funded at the producer level. This was the first program at the processor level. Anybody who's in the food processing building business knows that that did not come from increasing milk consumption, right? The only reason our processors in California got together and put together a generic non barnet program was per capita consumption was going down every year. <laughs> right? And so we're, com we're a commodity board. We were, I'm not part of it, but the milk processor board is a commodity board. We have beef, eggs, potatoes, raisins, prunes, strawberries. They're funded by the industry and they're marketing generically, so not branded. So that's the genesis of, of Got Milk. If I'd ask you to go back now, please, to 1993, is this not perfect? This, this cover of Time Magazine? I mean, if this isn't a woman on the ascent, I'm not sure I know one. Um, so let's go back to 93. Um, there was one global strategy for milk. We looked at milk marketing campaigns all around the world, and Germany, uh, the UK, uh, Scandinavia, South America, everywhere around the world in developed nations. And, and at that point, China wasn't consuming milk. But all around the world, and there was one global strategy. Anybody want to give it to me? Milk is good for you. Thank you. All around the world, didn't matter what the language was, executed in different ways, there was one strategy, and every year milk consumption went down. <laughs> okay? So what, ha what was happening, it was, we realized, is that people were, were, had completely bought off on the fact that milk was good for you, and 96% believed it, and they reached for Gatorade. So you would talk to people and you would say, is milk good for you? And they'd say, yes, milk is good. It's got calcium and protein and my kids got to have it for milk and so can I have a Gatorade, please? Or a Coke Zero or a bottled water. So it was an intellectual argument and into, that wasn't affecting behavior. And we've seen a couple of presentations about changing behavior, not just intellectually, but actually getting consumers to do something differently. Not so easy. So 
the dairy industry, at least in the U.S., does ridiculous amounts of research. I mean, just spends millions and millions of dollars on research, much of which is never acted on. But we looked at it, and, and when you looked at the research and then looked at the marketing programs, milk was being marketed, again, globally, not just in the U.S. and California, as a standalone beverage, and we've all seen it, right? Glass of milk lit beautifully, little drips of, of perspiration coming down the thing. Problem. Almost all milk's consumed with food, <laughs> okay? With the exception of maybe teenage boys who are bottomless pits and will drink most anything, milk is almost always consumed with food of some sort. It is not Coca-Cola. It is not Gatorade. It is not bottled water. It's milk, okay? But the dairy industry was showing us glass of milk. Well, it didn't connect with how people actually use milk. So um, I have, which I can laugh at myself, it was the Manning Yum Yum strategy. So I had this thought, well, let's sell soup, food and milk, cookies and milk. Luckily uh, for me, um, we, ha we have a wonderful had and do have, same agency, advertising agency, said, well, you're kind of, kind of half right. Um, give people the food, let them eat that brownie, let them pour that bowl of Cheerios, let them um, reach for Oreos, and then, Take the milk away. It's not a milk, it's not a food and milk strategy. It's a food and no milk strategy. Really interesting twist. Um, it, we, we joke about the fact that you can't even hear this cereal without milk, right? Rice Krispies were built on snap, crackle, and pop. Well, guess what? You got to pour that milk. So the first thing I'd ask you to do as you begin to apply which I know you're desperate to do, apply all these learnings, is to say, you know, is there a milk deprivation, is there a way of looking at your business akin to milk deprivation? So it's not the first look in, right? It's not, it's, it's not oh yeah, milk's good for you. That's the easy way in. The, and it wasn't milk, food and milk yum yum strategy. It was take the milk away. Take the milk away and suddenly it became, because when you pour, when you pour a bowl of Honey Nut Cheerios and you slice your banana, there's no other beverage on earth that works other than milk. Very interesting. So this strategy, focus, competitive, proprietary, potent, pliable, sustainable over time. Um, the most important thing I think about a strategy, um, whether it be for Safeway stores or Bank of America or a small food product, is it's true. We did not make up milk deprivation. Milk deprivation was there waiting to be tapped waiting to be mined. Dairy industry just hadn't done it, but it was right there underneath the surface. So, but that strategy has to be true. This is the gentleman who really deserves all the credit as far as I'm concerned, isn't it? He's also a Jeff, Jeff Goodby. And he was at the agency and he was the genesis of, of deprivation and to this day still writes on Got Milk, interestingly. So he's a storyteller and here's the first story he told. This is the first Got Milk commercial would have been early 1994, and this is how we expressed milk deprivation. Okay, the guys are gonna make it work for me. There it goes. Volume. And that was the Vienna Wood Dance in D, one of my all-time favorites. And now let's make that random call with today's $10,000 question. It's a tough one. Who shot Alexander Hamilton in that famous duel? All right, let's go to the phones and see who's out there. Mm -hmm. Hello, for $10,000, who shot... Mm -hmm. Excuse me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid your time is almost done. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, maybe next time. Uh So I had to sell to a board of directors the idea that we were going to do our first commercial about this esoteric piece of American history that didn't show our product. We were not going to show milk. And much to their credit, they said, got it. Milk deprivation, you can't show milk. So two more examples of, of just some storytelling from the early stages. Hey, Boopy. I don't 
think so, Baldy. Good luck. Okay, so that's a little bit closer to home. And then uh, the last of these three. Mike Proctor is a student at Buckley University. So the University, academics amongst us. And he's about to participate in a remarkable experiment. Heading the research effort, Dr. Iqbal Viva. Uh, the subject is uh, 24 years old. We are trying to make it very comfortable for him. We have big screen television, uh, video games, stereo, and of course, plenty, plenty of his uh, favorite food. He will live inside this small chamber, cut off from all human contact in the name of science, alone. Hey, uh, this one's empty there, uh, you know? For the next 30 days. Oh, no, 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 guys. I didn't sign on for this. Guys, I got tons of zero. OK, it's OK. I know you're in there. I want to move. Got a smile. Can you please a little bit? Good milk. So storytelling. So. Again, strategy is one point. Storytelling is another point. I, I'm finding with the, the, the folks I work with that rather than big strategy documents and oftentimes uh, tons of research, one of the most productive ways of starting up an innovation project is the narrative of the brand. Telling a story in a, in a paragraph of what this is all about. And that's all Jeffrey did, is he told the story of milk deprivation in 30 or 60 seconds. And again, 1994, we use a lot of television. Right now, now it would be much more social media. But it's an interesting thing to do to write a paragraph, 20 words, max, 30 max, a narrative about the brand that expresses it to people in a way that they can understand, as opposed to business talk. Um, recognize the idea. Um, I, I made a $300,000 mistake early in the program. Um, we uh, have a, had a PR agency that said, hey, why don't we, why don't we um, ask a lot of Hollywood stars to not drink milk for a couple of weeks, and then we'll interview them, and then we'll get their stories, and we'll get all this publicity. Okay, let's do that. It was a big program. And so we did it, and we got nothing. I mean, not a story, not an article, not a video, nothing, zero. So I said, well, gee, uh, how about if I call some of the reporters? And of course, the PR people went, no, 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 you can't do that. I said, well, no, it's OK. I'm going to call the reporters. And I talked with them, and I said, hey, it's your, whatever you want to cover is fine with me, but just tell me, why didn't you cover it? And they said, because it was not news. You made it up. You made up. You gave this milk. You said to them, don't drink milk. And then you, it wasn't news. It wasn't real. And then every one of them said, but did you do that Alan Burr commercial, that Got Milk commercial? I said, y yeah, we did that. We, we produced it. And they said, OK, can we do a story on that? And in that moment, we realized that the brand was not milk. Milk is white, comes in gallons, and is boring. Got Milk was really interesting, and it was funny, and it was smart. And people talked about it, and people, as you will see, ripped it off. So Got Milk became our brand, not milk. Interesting moment in time for us. Um, big ideas get overlooked oftentimes. Um, oftentimes, the idea of a deprivation strategy, for instance, it's just below the sur surface, and they get covered. So when you have news, when you create news, what, again, that's true, as Got Milk did, other people cover it for you, and, and they express your message, and that's what advocates are doing now on social media. We didn't have social media. We didn't have cell phones. Um, they're, expressing, they're expressing now in social media messages. This is how Got Milk was expressed. Whoops. I need to go back. Can I go back? Red button, right? OK. One more time. Sorry, guys. Here. You're managing Here. this for me, I can tell. <laughs> and once again. 
Nope, help me, guys. Here, Same commercial. So, next one. Do you want to do it? Thank you. I knew you were going to say something. Well, I mean, it says got milk with a question mark, and I would say there's no question mark there, actually. <laughs> So, so the point is that if we do things with our brands that become newsworthy, um, whatever they might be, um, then they do get covered and other people express that for us. And in this case, it was Cosby and Leonard. But um, now it would be advocates and, and all sorts of other folks. Um, these ideas are all around us. Um, and again, I'm such a believer in, in collaborations and partnerships. I don't think you can do it alone. I actually don't believe. You can't do it alone anymore. Um, but we looked around and we saw Girl Scouts. Well, in the months of January and February, the Girl Scouts of America, at least in the US, sell more cookies than Nabisco. I grew up with that one for a second, right? All these just charming little girls knocking on doors. How do you say no to that? It's impossible, literally. Thin mints, I'll take four boxes. They had never done anything commercially, ever, because they're the Girl Scouts of America. So we went to them in, in California and said, well, but, but what do you think people are drinking with all these Thin Mints? And it was milk, of course. And they said, yeah, but we can't do anything with brands. We said, oh, but we're not a brand. That's, that, I have other discussions where I'm saying, of course we're a brand. <laughs> we're not a brand. We're milk. And so um, a couple of thousand Girl Scouts carried Got Milk buttons and signage and walked around and knocked on doors and said to people, well, why don't you get some milk with this Thin Mint? So the ideas are all around us. This was always there for the dairy industry. They just, they didn't do it because if you remember, they wanted to always show milk without food. So how could they collaborate? And yet here are all these marvelous sales ladies out there. Um, simplify. I am so much a believer in simplifying. It can't get more simple than a hostess cupcake, a bite taken out, and got milk, right? That's our, that's our business. Um, it's not always so easy. This is a campaign. But I would encourage you to think about how do you take stuff out of the mission statement? How do you take things out of the mission statement? Not what you add back in, not because a board of directors says, hey, I think we should add this in, and somebody else says, I think we should. No, guys. It's what do you take out of the mission statement that makes it powerful? This is it. Milk deprivation in a Costas cupcake. So simplify. Um, I don't know, this is such an old, old slide, but it seems to make sense to me. So go back to 94. So we had a target audience of um, women, primarily, because they buy most milk, in families with two or more kids. That's our target audience, which is the target audience for a vast majority of food processors. Um, this is our media plan. Most media plans are about 250 pages, and they have quintile analyses. And that our, tar our media plan was reach men and women, families, at home with the television on 30 feet from the fridge. Because that's where you drink milk. Nobody drinks milk out of home, honest and truly. They don't. How many people here had a glass of milk today? None. They didn't serve it. Right? This is our media plan because you, we wanted to reach people, the right people, where they could act on the message. Okay. So interesting, and again, you have to apply this for me because not everybody has millions of dollars in television, but provide, reaching people where they can't act kind of doesn't make sense, or at least it doesn't make as much sense. I mean, the dairy industry spent millions and millions of dollars um, sponsoring NASCAR because they wanted tickets to NASCAR, right? Nobody drinks milk at a NASCAR race. They don't serve milk at a NASCAR race. So why do it? Why do it? Okay. So in, given that we want to be simple, here is a simple idea executed.
Okay. Now, the reason that's important, other than simplicity, is that this was an idea a very junior writer at the agency had. He said, you know, I, I have given my dog peanut butter, probably not very good for it, and it does this thing for like 10 minutes. And I want to, and we said, yeah, we got a lot of other stuff to do. And he said, can I go shoot it? We said, go shoot it if you want to. This was about a $2,000 ad. I mean, it was nothing. It was petty cash. And he came back. He, obviously, it was somebody's son in somebody's lab and a handheld video cam. And this thing ran uh, nationally in the US. Uh, as a, so sometimes those simple things come out of um, not the most senior people, but they come out of employees and, and staff. That, that just have a great idea. It was a wonderful idea. Um, make the idea pervasive. Um, the idea here is that in order to change behavior about a brand or a category or a, a retailer or a food service operator, it takes a lot of frequency, a lot of impressions, a lot of times. So we tried very hard to, to make Got Milk pervasive, not just run television advertising. For instance, we licensed Got Milk for Got Milk chocolate. Not a profound idea, but made sense. We licensed it for infant wear. There were, for a while in the early 90s, lots and lots and lots of little kids being uh, wheeled around with Got Milk onesies. We licensed it for ice cream, Got Milk ice cream. We did soccer balls. We have a very, very large Latino population in, in uh, California. And back then, it was mostly the Latinos who played soccer. Not now so much, but then it was. So with lots of that. And then we licensed it to the National Milk Processor Board. We licensed the trademark so they would take it nationally with the Milk Mustache campaign. So the, the way the model we wanted was we wanted somebody to, to wake up in the morning, maybe they'd turn the TV on, they'd see a television ad that we ran, then they would hear a, a, something on the radio on the way to work, and then they'd get to work and somebody would laugh and say, got pants, Ricky? And, and, and all throughout the day, you would, sorry, did I say that? I'm sorry. Um, but, so all throughout the day, they would see a baby coming down the street in a Got Milk onesie, and then they, uh, they would see a, a, a bunch of kids playing soccer, and they'd look down, and there would be the logo. So six, seven, eight, ten times a day. That was very expensive. It is now much, much more realistic to do it, frankly, because of the internet. We had to pay for all of that stuff or license it. But, but it's much more um, realistic to do it now. I would just suggest to you that it you takes a lot of frequency to build a brand, not just run an ad or, or run a promotion. Avoid death by command. Um, I, I say to people, this is so simple, what's the difference between get milk and got milk? Okay? It was brilliant, not me, by the way, I get to say it because it was good being those guys. Because I, I was of the proctor mode where you told people what you wanted them to do, right? Wash your clothes with Tide. Use Crest toothpaste. I mean, on and on and on and on. And, and Jeffrey said, yeah, but, but that what you get is a hand in your face, right, that says, hey, I don't want to be lectured from an advertiser. Let's do it the other way. Let's ask the question, got milk. It is absolutely right, absolutely right. Give the idea away. Here's one that a lot of people don't understand. So, so um, Lee Rubin came to us. He's a cartoonist out of Seattle and said, hey, I'd like to do a series of Got Milk cartoons. What would you charge us? And we said, please, do the cartoons. We're not going to charge you anything. Use it. And so he did. And of course, it ran syndicated for, I don't know, a year or two. Um, Cookies and cereal companies. Um, so we have Pillsbury, and we have Nabisco, and we have Mothers and Keeblers. And we didn't charge people. They said, can we put Got Milk on our packaging? And we said, of course you can put Got Milk on your packaging. We didn't want to charge for it. How, how do you value Pillsbury putting it with a doughboy? How, how do you put a value on that? So give the idea, if you have something valuable, give it away. Touch the senses. Um, this is an outdoor board. I mean, clearly, as food marketers, we know that. But you have to always touch the senses. And um, we, we did a lot of focus group, a lot of qualitative research, no quantitative. Um, and when we would start to show this stuff in groups, especially amongst women, outdoor like this, they would, they would literally start to say, I, you know, I need chocolate. <laughs> I need chocolate. And in fact, we gave it to them in the groups and then didn't give them milk. 
No, because that's what, that's, it's an amazing thing. When you give people it, it, it's not important any longer. But when they got their chocolate and we didn't give them milk, we got so much wonderful response. Touch the emotion. So here's some, the idea is that what is the emotional charge of your brand? If you talked with consumers, or suppliers for that matter, what's the emotional charge? You, I know the intellectual thing is yes, we have 400 stores, or yes, we have the fastest growing um, uh, probiotic brand, but what's the emotional charge underneath that? And we tried to capture that in television. What's the matter, can you see? Did you think I wouldn't find out? Is this about the ring I gave you? Listen, a cubic zirconia looks just like a real diamond. Is this about my time in prison? You drank the last of the milk. <laughs> It's a spot that made men very nervous, actually. Um, and then another, different, quite different. So, you know, sometimes one has to be a little provocative. Um, I got a call from the Archdiocese of Calif in San Francisco. <laughs> and so this would have been late 90s. And, um, and the message was basically, we think you're insulting the church, you're, you're disparaging the church, you're saying things about the church that's not right. And my response to that was, I think you have larger issues at stake right at the moment than my Got Milk commercial. And never heard from them again, as you would imagine. <laughs> And then one more. Drink your milk, kids. I don't want milk. Milk's for babies. Yeah, babies. Oh, yeah? Well, I happen to know that milk helps build strong bones. So drink up. Well, Mr. Miller told me he never drinks milk. Look at him. Yeah. Hi, kid. <laughs> That, that was for a board member who said, I really want to see you do good for you. We said, okay, we'll do good for you. We'll do it our way. We'll do milk deprivation good for you. But there's a charge there. I mean, you know, people laugh or I get criticisms, you know, and have gotten criticism about the work, but it, it's charged. There's something there about Got Milk that's not just another TV spot or another brand. So there is some emotional charge that I would seek um, out in, in every brand. Um, it's not always about the money. I got a call um, four or five years, probably three, four years after Got Milk launched in California, and it was from the Barbie uh, brand manager from Mattel. And I thought it was absolutely amazing because I then had a 10-year-old daughter, and I thought, wow, how did they know, right? Bar you know, Barbie brand manager, how did they know? Turns out my daughter wouldn't go near a Barbie, but she said, no, 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 we're thinking about doing a, a cookie and milk Barbie, but could we name it Got Milk? And of course I said, oh, I don't know. I guess you can, sure. You know, so several million Barbies went out there carrying the Got Milk logo. So it's not always, it's back to giving the idea away. It's not always about money. Sometimes it's about helping other people succeed so that they can help your brand. Swim downstream. Um, uh, again, I seem to do a lot of this. Um, I had this idea of a great glass of white, right, for uh, white tablecloth restaurants, and I think, wow, we're going to turn this around. We're going to get people to drink milk in good restaurants and stuff. And we tried it, and it failed miserably, of course. Um, nobody ordered the milk, and after three or four days, the restaurant took it off the menu. It didn't belong. But, but, the flip side of that is we went to the McDonald's franchisees group in California, and we said, what are you putting on that Happy Meal? This is just at the beginning of when McDonald's was catching flack for not having anything um, on the menu that was kind of vaguely healthy. 
and, and in the early days. And so they said, well, we have Coke, of course. And we said, well, you know, don't you think there's an opportunity on a Happy Meal for kids? Why don't you put milk on instead and see what happens? Well, of course, they said, well, that, that's an interesting idea. And so they put milk on and just sold the blazes out of Happy Meals and the blazes out of milk. And they came back and said, well, milk sales are really up. I said, well, there's a really profound observation. And then, uh, of course, um, a couple of months later, Coke got a whiff of it and psh, off went milk and on went Coke again. But the point is that um, the brands have boundaries to them. And it's great to try to extend those boundaries, to try to be all things. But in this case, milk had a boundary. And the boundary was it's not, not going to be in white tablecloth restaurants. But it does belong on the Happy Meal. So where are the brand boundaries, if you would? Um, no mas leche. Um, we, thank goodness, did some research. Uh, again, I don't know how many of you market it to ethnic uh, groups and populations. But we were on the verge of doing uh, mas leche. The problem was, we learned very quickly, was that it also can be translated not just more milk, it can be translated as are you lactating. So we didn't do mas leche. And we did another campaign instead. But well worthwhile um, doing that research, basic fundamental research, if one is going to uh, talk to uh, other ethnic groups. Um, so this is one of my favorite all-time um, ads. Uh, cartoons. That was the dumbest, most inane thing I've ever heard in my life. You're a sniveling idiot, and if you weren't my client, I'd kick the living snot out of you. And what she says is, that's a really interesting idea. The point here is treating suppliers, agencies are one source of suppliers, any suppliers like they were the client. There's this enormous temptation as clients to say, well, I'm paying the bills, therefore you will do what I ask you to do. You will, because I'm playing the bill. And the bigger the client, the more that attitude pervades. The more that, Walmart? Anybody ever had a Walmart meeting? It's crazy. The way to get the most out of suppliers is to treat them like clients. Be their favorite customer. Be their favorite customer. Jeff Goodby writes on Got Milk to this day, 21 years later, because he loves working on Got Milk. And, and they bill a tiny portion of his billion dollar budget. Tiny portion, big, this is a big thought, this one. Um, welcome controversy, oh, sorry, I should go back. Yes, uh, welcome controversy. Um, Got Milk has been ripped off, uh, I don't know, this is a tiny portion of all the rip offs. And in the beginning we thought, oh, we're gonna sue these people. It turns out it's probably one of the best things that ever happened to us is every time somebody would see got insurance or got junk or whatever the got happened to be, they would say, what a dumb ripoff of got milk. So you have to have some controversy, intelligent risk and intelligent controversy in order to get covered. You really do. Consolidate, aggregate, um, this for us meant licensing got milk nationally and it turned out that at least for a few years before the politics got us, um, something like $250 million was going behind one tagline for the dairy industry. And of course, it didn't last long because other people wanted their taglines, but it, it was a huge, huge deal, the milk mustache coming out of the national group in Washington. Empower the idea, this has got milk the book. There are probably you know, 150 copies available in the world. I have 148 of those <laughs> copies. Um, it didn't sell any. I mean, it just, I mean, it got on the shelf and, and they sent it back. But it was an incredible PR tool. I can't tell you how the media loves books. They have no idea what the book is about. They don't, it doesn't have to be great literature, but we had so much, so many television, national television interviews on the basis of this book. And then they would play the ads. So the sales of the book meant nothing. It was empowering the brand that made a difference. So my question to you is, you know, are you gonna write a book? Are you gonna do a speech? Are you gonna have a blog? How do you empower your brand so that it gets covered. Whether you sell any books or not doesn't make any difference. And we're getting toward the end. Choose partners carefully. This is one of the milk mustache. I'm not even sure the guy's name. I know he's very famous. Um, it made no, s and they did what they wished as long as within certain guidelines. If you're talking to moms with larger families, this guy probably isn't the most influential. You know, they did it because it was cool and they could get him and all of that. On the other hand, we went to the children's television workshop and said, 
what has he been drinking all these years, right? He's been saying cookies and cookies. What's he been drinking? And the answer, of course, was, was milk. And so we license, we didn't license, we license free the use of Cookie Monster in our advertising because, of course, that is what he's been drinking all of these years. Um, almost at the end, new metrics. Um, this is great. For the last time, no, I do not know what the ROI is. Um, sometimes it's difficult. For a category, it's very difficult. I will share with you. For a category like milk or beef or eggs or potatoes, it's very difficult to get a return on investment because there's so many variables that affect sales other than what we do. But we try. We try. So um, this is a chart which shows the gallons of milk in California between whatever it was, 91 and 2000 and something. And the black line are actuals. The red line is projected, straight line projection of where it was going. There was no other, there was no change in it in California milk other than the Got Milk campaign. So what we ended up doing is saying, okay, we actually didn't increase milk sales much, but we did, um, if you look at the difference between where it was going and where it ended, um, the math works out to be about a 10 to 1 return. So that was one of the ways we looked at how do you, how do we talk to our processors about a return on investment. Um, the other is we did a, a little piece of research that made a lot of chief marketing officers immensely nervous. Um, this was national, um, and we asked people if they could accurately um, name the tagline, not the brand. So it's not are you aware of Coke, but are you aware of the current tagline? That, that was the question. So the second highest was Bud at 16.5%. Budweiser probably spends close to a billion dollars a year in the U.S. on advertising. Then they did. Okay, and 16.5% of the people could name, guys, could name, could say what the tagline was. And we were at about 50%. And of course, what we did with this is use it to get news. Um, but it, it did make, I think, some people nervous. Um, words that kill ideas, here just some thoughts at the end for me. Um, I think complacently, complacency, we're talking about food safety, and, and it, it's a killer, guys. Um, it, if things could be going well, and it's the time to work harder. It, it's, when things are going well, it's the time to be most critical because you're about to get kicked in the groin. Almost inevitably, that's what's going to happen. So complacency, this idea that sales are okay and things are going well, that's when you have to dig in and make it more difficult and challenge. The other is consensus. It's great to have a board of directors. It's great to collaborate. It's great to have chief marketing officers. But ultimately, making decisions is really, really important. And consensus oftentimes, oftentimes, is going to kill good ideas. Somebody has to believe in it and go with it and, and, um, to get there. On the other side, uh, idea, words that nourish, crisis. So, here's an, so this is my thought. And this is kind of weird. Simulate crisis. Simulate crisis. It's, it's the polar opposite of the complacency. Things are going well. What would happen if? What would happen if? And PR agencies have these crisis management programs. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about sitting down with management and saying, okay, sales are up 2.9%, store, same store sales, blah, 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 blah. What would we do today if sales were down by 4%? What would we do? But it's not, they're up by 2.5%. I'm saying that's not the question. What would we do if we hit some crisis? So you simulate crisis just like we simulate flying a, a, an airplane. What do you do when you simulate flying an airplane? You simulate crisis. Everything's going fine. You don't need the machine. You're flying along. That training program is all about simulating crisis before it happens. So I would say that was one thought. Second thought is conflict. Friendly, intelligent conflict. Encourage it. Encourage dissonance. Encourage people not to agree, because that's where good ideas come from. And then finally, collaboration. I don't know if you can see it or not, but on the cookie, it actually has embossed on it, got milk. So this is my, was my proudest moment. Of all the stuff we did, of all the ads we did, when Nabisco agreed to put Got Milk on their Oreo, I thought, yeah, we've kind of made some progress. Um, so collaboration is just a huge deal. And lastly, a little spot on partners in deprivation.
Thanks so much. I really appreciate it.